It's been over three years now we tried to work things out in our community. Tonight, five former chiefs of a small First Nation in Northern Quebec are asking for help with their band council. What we're deeply concerned about is the fact that uh, neither Quebec, the Quebec government, nor the federal government um, reached out to us in terms of any kind of meaningful consultation on the project. Concerns over a new multi-billion dollar project in Quebec. This year we have 85 teams in four divisions, so we have about 1,320 athletes here. And one of the biggest basketball tournaments in Canada took place in Terrace over the weekend. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Five former chiefs of an Algonquin First Nation in Northern Quebec were in Ottawa today to ask the Minister of Indigenous Services to intervene in a band council situation they say has become dysfunctional. Fraser Needham has more. One of the former chiefs at Tuesday's press conference was James Papati of the Kitsisakic First Nation. It's been over three years now we tried to work things out in our community. Before getting going to public, we, we had a number, number, lot of meeting with uh, those people, tried to bring them back on the right track, but it didn't happen. They keep controlling, they keep uh, doing what they, what I call the abusing power over the general manager and also the, over the women of the community. And us, we had enough. The group is alleging there have been financial improprieties, conflict of interest and harassment of band members. Kitsisakik is a small community of about 400 people located roughly 130 kilometers south of Valdor. Some community residents currently don't have access to either electricity or running water. And Papati says the chaos is hampering efforts to bring both hydro and water into the community. They don't even consider our planning for a new village and that's a kind of control of the information that they're exercising right now and it's very difficult to answer our community when, when they ask for when the community's project is going to move on, when the power is going to be there, when the uh, water is going to be in, available for our community. In an emailed statement, the Kitsakik Bank Council said it was aware of the press conference but would not be commenting at this time. APTN reached out to Minister of Indigenous Services Patty Hyju's office for comment but did not hear back by airtime. Fraser Needham, APTN National News, Ottawa. To Iqaluit now, where a building containing several local businesses was completely destroyed in a fire today. As of this afternoon, the blaze was extinguished, but firefighters were still on the scene. The building was home to Nunatsiak News, a local newspaper that's been an institution for 50 years. Also housed in the buildings was an Inuit-owned advertising and communication agency, as well as IUT, a language authority under the Nunavut uh, Legislative Assembly. According to the paper, the fire started around 8 a.m. By noon, the fire had intensified. Parts of the street were blocked off to, and the uh, fire was still being fought as of Tuesday afternoon. At this time, the cause of the fire is still unknown. The Mohawk Council of Ganawage has denounced the governments of Quebec and Canada for what they claim is a failure to consult regarding the multi-billion dollar North Volt Battery Plan project. Construction will pave over an important wetlands near Montreal. Maricel Amador spoke to Chief Ross Montour about the situation. My biggest right is my responsibility, is my responsibility, my custodial responsibility to the environment. Last week, during a press conference in Montreal, the Mohawk Council of Ganawage, along with several environmental groups, accused Quebec of prioritizing profit over protecting the environment. The groups claimed the government has been less than transparent and questioned their handling of the North Vault electric vehicle battery plant project. Right now, what we're, we're deeply concerned about is the fact that uh, neither Quebec, the Quebec government, nor the federal government um, reached out to us in terms of any kind of meaningful consultation on the project. The $7 billion project was announced in September and will produce electric car batteries. The work on the future factory is in Montreal's South Shore. 
Construction began in January after receiving authorization by the Provincial Environment Department. At that site are endangered species. We have there uh, 142 bird species, including 14 at risk. But Chief Montour said that the Mohawk Council has only had one meeting with the province regarding the future battery plant. They attempted to have one consultation with us where they said they didn't have, they didn't have a duty to consult. Okay, and I'm sorry, but I said, I, I said, I'm not sorry. You guys are, you're behaving like pimps. The federal government and the province will invest $2.7 billion for the construction of the factory. It is expected to be built by the end of 2026. Si on est ici aujourd'hui, c'est pas pour s'opposer à un projet, c'est pour demander au gouvernement d'arrêter de jouer dans la réglementation environnementale et dans les mécanismes de consultation publique à sa guise. Marc-André Vio, the director of governmental relations with the environmental group Equitaire, said the lack of transparency by Quebec has eroded the public's trust in the project. Ce que le gouvernement a fait, c'est que le gouvernement a créé une réglementation pour que la compagnie ne soit pas soumise au mécanisme de consultation publique euh, du, du bureau d'audience publique en environnement. Euh, donc, à ce moment-là, la compagnie n'a pas à présenter tous les documents de façon publique. Although the Environmental Public Hearing Office is not a decision-making body, it requires public consultation on the impacts of any projects that affect the environment and issues recommendations. But for Northvolt, they streamlined the process. La mentalité derrière, derrière euh, la, la vision du gouvernement, c'est vraiment de créer un cadre réglementaire spécifique pour l'entreprise. Et ça, c'est problématique parce que personne ne sait à quoi s'attendre. Northvolt did not respond to a request for comment. In late January, a Quebec Superior Court judge rejected an injunction request to stop the work by the Quebec Environmental Law Center. The Mohawk Council of Ganawage filed a lawsuit with Quebec Superior Court to demand orders requiring both levels of government to engage in consultation. Right now, there's a, there's a mediator that's that's been appointed, uh, who's um, formerly was functioned as a lawyer, is now a judge, mm -hmm. and so we'll be we'll be uh, looking at and discussing the merits of our uh, our motion there in a case management uh, way, and then we'll see down the road whether or not there's further action to take. Quebec's environment ministry was unable to speak to APTN News before the deadline. Maricela Amador, APTN National News, Montreal. We'd like to hear what you think about the Northvolt project and the concerns raised or anything else you'd like to reach out about. If you have a story you want to share, you can send us an email to news at aptn.ca. You can also read or watch our stories over on our website. That's aptnnews.ca. And you can find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Caldwell First Nation and Parks Canada have put pen to paper on an agreement to co-govern a proposed national urban park in Windsor's West End. CTV's Sanjay Maru has the details and why this is part of reconciling with the area's Indigenous peoples. It's Canada's southernmost point, Point Pelee National Park, but this land serves as a cornerstone of a painful past for Indigenous people. Caldwell First Nation inhabited this park. We were burned out, our homes were burned out, and, and we were asked to leave. And we did. That was around the 1800s. Now in 2024, Caldwell First Nation is standing side by side with the federal government, signing a memorandum of understanding <laughs> to explore shared governance of Windsor's proposed National Urban Park. We're both interested in exploring different options for the proposed urban park in Windsor alongside other First Nations that may become involved and our partners in the Windsor area. The memorandum commits the federal government to explore opportunities for things like First Nations-led conservation, park operations and wildlife management. It is not a legally binding contract, but Caldwell First Nation Chief Mary Duckworth says she has no concern about the distinction in the language. I don't have any worries about that at all. We spent two years talking about what it could look like and what needs to happen on both sides. So I, I'm not even worried. All 
parks that are being established new um, and there are many as you know we have a, a broad 30 by 30 agenda to create 10 new national parks 10 new marine conservation areas and 15 urban parks by 2030 and as we work forward on all of those we're working in collaboration with um, First Nations and Indigenous partners across the country. Officials say there is no clear timeline on when the proposed National Urban Park will be designated as Parks Canada continues to work toward establishing boundaries and agreements with lower levels of government. Sanjay Maru, CTV News. The Indigenous Screen Office, known for backing Indigenous-led films and TV shows, is branching out. Details after that are on that after the break. Welcome back. 12 Indigenous-led podcast projects are getting a funding boost. The Indigenous Screen Office is allocating $300,000 to the creation and development of the podcasts. For more on the initiative and the projects, we're joined by the CEO of the ISO, Carrie Swanson. Carrie, thanks so much for being with us here. Uh, I guess, you know, when people think about the Indigenous Screen Office, it's usually movies or television. So uh, can you tell us a bit about why the ISO is getting involved in, in funding podcasts? Yeah, yeah. Well, we had this opportunity to partner with Google.org, which is the philanthropic uh, arm of Google in Canada. And we thought that podcasting had clearly become such an important part of the broadcasting ecosystem and it's not something that most traditional funders 
in the in the sector support. And given that we're an indigenous green office with um, the connection that podcasting has to traditional oral storytelling, we thought it was the perfect opportunity for us. Yeah, there's really been some uh, big indigenous led podcasts over the last few years. Yes, so many, and um, we're expanding that to some emerging talent um, to host their first po podcast, and also for many of those who already have uh, many seasons under their belt to continue that work. Yeah, so uh, funding announced for 12 podcasts. Can you tell us a, a little bit about a couple of them? Yeah, I mean, there are 12 podcasts from across the country. So we've got five provinces represented. And the the lineup really represents the diversity of Indigenous storytelling. So we've got podcasts ranging from ancestral knowledge, stories about the land. We have one really interesting one documenting a family of five uh, learning and speaking the Anishinaabe language in their home as second language learners. And we also have some on music, matriarchy, indigenous futurisms. And one that you might be interested in is an APTN series uh, Tales from the Res that it is expanding that universe uh, through uh, a new podcast. They all sound pretty good. Uh, Carrie, the last time, uh, at least that I spoke with you, you know, it was about the ISO and the uncertainty around uh, the future funding for the ISO. Uh, it was recently announced, you know, the $65 million over five years, stable funding going forward of $13 million a year. Uh, what do you think that's going to mean for Indigenous-led projects in Canada? It's so important to us and to the community to have that foundation. So we don't have to now spend our time lobbying for funding. We know that it's going to be there. And these are the building blocks now for, for the ISO to grow and to continue this real trajectory of success that we've had over the last six years. So it couldn't have come at a more perfect time. It's absolutely uh, one of the most meaningful milestones yet in our history. And we only expect to continue to grow and support the incredible storytellers um, across the country. Right on, Carrie. We'll have to leave it there, but appreciate you taking some time for us. Uh, looking forward to seeing you in real life in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Indigenous broadcasters, including APTN and content makers from around the world, have gathered in Utiaroa, New Zealand, for the World Indigenous Content Conference. Hosted by Fukata Maori Television, the conference brings cultures together through the power of media and storytelling. We get more in this report from our friends at National Indigenous Television in Australia. A powerful welcome by a warrior through song and dance for the World Indigenous Television Content Conference. Hosted by Fukata Māori TV, the conference allows Indigenous creative minds from around the world to collaborate, be inspired and amplify their voices on the global stage and cultural exchange. We share our culture, our language, our mind, our heart. A week full of cultural exchange, panel talks and workshops for the Samai people who have lived in northern Scandinavia for thousands of years. It's a chance to talk about issues affecting them. The Whitburn uh, collaboration is, is really uh, important for, for us. It's, uh, uh, it's important for us to, to, uh, to uh, share the knowledge, uh, to share best practices. There's, uh, we we uh, already gained a lot of inspiration. Language preservation and culture has been a key theme of the conference, as well as the importance of Indigenous storytelling. Shared issues like government support, audience engagement and the ever-changing digital landscape were high on the agenda. I hope to learn, learn how other people, the other broadcasters cope with their challenges and bring some inspiration back home. Uh, learn from the best practices uh, and hopefully uh, 
we can also teach uh, from how we do, uh, how, how we, we cope with our challenges. Coming together with thousands of years of knowledge and history and moving into a platform of storytelling. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, Marcella Sinalunga, NITV News. Looks like a great conference. Time for one last quick break. Still to come, nearly 90 basketball teams gather for the Junior All-Native Tournament. You know, this is a gathering of people where uh, a lot of the coaches, the managers, you know, they played before and, you know, they see players from other communities. It's a chance to connect again. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Landscape photography extraordinaire Clarence Jones shared this picture where the Bulkley River flows into the Skeena River, the Gitsan Nation. Another amazing photo. Thanks for sharing as always, Clarence. You can send your photos to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be featured as our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 8 in Halifax, 11 for Fredericton. Minus 3 with flurries in Kuduak, snow and 4 below in Nain. 14 in Montreal, plus 8 for Val d'Or and Shibugumu. 7 above in Sault Ste. Marie, plus 2 in North Bay. Minus 5 with snow in Thunder Bay, snow and 11 below in Sioux Lookout. Minus 10 for God's Lake, 8 below and snow in Norway House. Minus 6 for Winnipeg, cloudy and 11 below in Dauphin. Sun's out and 0 in Regina, minus 1 for Saskatoon. Minus 4 with snow in Meadow Lake, 6 below in La Ronge. In northern Alberta, 0 with snow in high level, cloudy and 5 for Grand Prairie. 10 in Edmonton, 6 in Lethbridge. 9 for Vancouver, 11 in Victoria and Kamloops. 8 for Prince George, 10 in Smithers. Minus 7 in Old Crow, plus 7 in Whitehorse. 
Minus three for Yellowknife and Norman Wells. One below in Wrigley. Minus 21 in Saks Harbor. One below for Politoch with Snow. Minus 14 in Chesterfield and Whale Cove. Minus 15 for Resolute, Arctic Bay and Joe Haven. Over 1,300 young athletes from BC First Nations uh, communities gathered in the city of Terrace last week. The youth came to compete in one of the largest basketball tournaments in Canada, the Junior All-Native. APTN's Lee Wilson reports. Nearly 90 basketball teams represented their communities at the Junior All-Native tournament. The youth competed against each other in four divisions from Monday to Friday, the first week of spring break in the province. Evan Gabriel and Eli Hall say they are proud to represent the New Hulk Nation, located on BC Central Coast. They put in lots of work for a chance to play. A lot of practices. Yeah, a lot of practices, fundraising. Yeah, it's been, it's been lots of fundraising, it's crazy. The Niska Nation is the tournament's host this year in the city of Terrace in Northern BC. Due to the size of the games, in order to provide accommodations and arenas, the Niska held the Junior All-Native in Simshan territory. Michael Davis is one of the managers. He explains how big the event is for the community. This year we have 85 teams in four divisions, so we have about 1,320 athletes here. That's just the athletes, so you think about the, the managers, the coaches, the chaperones, so there's quite a bit of people in town this week. According to Davis, the Junior All Native allows communities to come together. We like to gather and, uh, you know, this is a gathering of people where uh, a lot of the coaches, the managers, you know, they played before and, you know, they see players from other communities. It's a chance to connect again. The arenas were packed with fans cheering on athletes and volunteers making sure the games were a success. The youth tested their basketball skills against other nations in a double knockout basketball tournament until one team was crowned champion. Um, it's pretty fun to see other nations like play, play ball with other nations. Yeah. The Junior All Native Committee says the tournament is not just about basketball, but improving youth mental health. We're trying to bring inclusion in and we're trying uh, to build up the self-esteem, you know, the wellness and, you know, through sport, that's a great way to learn. It. Kelowna was announced as a location for next year's Junior All Native Basketball Tournament. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Terrace. Looks like a lot of fun. Welcome back to our Lee Wilson. Well, author and former broadcaster Michael Hutchinson is our guest on an all new episode of Face to Face tonight, right here after the news. Hutchinson is a familiar face for viewers as he was the former host of APTN National News and Face to Face. Over the past five years, he's been writing the Mighty Muskrats mystery series for young readers. The books have been compared to the Hardy Boys, but with Indigenous characters. Hutchinson says he wanted to write books that educated Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth about First Nations issues in history. But me being in media and being in First Nation politics for a long time, I get these questions from Canadians a lot of times uh, about First Nations and First Nation issues. And so what I wanted to do was write a book, you know, not only for First Nation kids to see themselves, but for also young Canadians to learn um, about the First Nation history and about some of the things. And the one thing about history, you know, is you can know it in your head, but it's something completely different to understanding in your heart how that uh, affects families and how that uh, affects kids. You can catch our interview with Michael Hutchinson right here in less than two minutes. We're all out of time for your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For news anytime, you can visit our website, APTN News. .ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Marcy Miigwech, thanks for being with us. Stick around. Face to Face is up next. We'll see you back here tomorrow.